What is up? Happy Monday. Welcome back. Chef Joel Gammon here with Homemade and so many amazing people. Hey, Debbie C., Mike Tonetti, I hope I'm saying that, Mary Flom, Lena Tucker, Miriam, Linda, Anna Marie Lewis, Diane Clark. What is up, everybody? Lena, I love the background, those flowers, beautiful. Paul, I need that mustache. I need that mustache. Mustaches are so in right now. I just feel like I need one. I can do it. I could do it if I needed to, and I kind of feel like I do. Elizabeth Griffin, nice to have you. Donna, Karen, Roslyn. What is going on, you guys? Over 1,200 people have signed up for this class. Not surprising. We've teamed up with the, emol like, the amazing, the iconic Fulton Fish Market out of New York City to make also the iconic seafood booyah base. Oh, how many booyah bases I've had that are so bad. I'm sorry. It's true. So many people mess it up when you nail it, when you just nail booyah base. Nothing in the world compares. Nothing. It is so good. It is so good. And so we are thrilled to have you here. A um, couple of just housekeeping rules. First, first and foremost, like I said, I'm Joel Gamron. I'm the founder and head chef here at Homemade. And the whole idea behind this is that you can interact with us. There's actually a couple of people you can interact with beyond us. We'll talk about Ariana and Mike. We'll, we'll get into that. But you can talk to me in real time as long as I can see your face and you're able to share your camera. Even if you're not cooking along, that is cool. That's absolutely cool. But you're able to talk to me and we can kind of unmute you. If that's not your jam, which is also cool, we have Chef George in the chat, total badass, total chef. He can answer so many questions about the recipe, around seafood, all that good stuff. But we do have some experts, not going to lie. We've got F from Fulton, right, from Fulton Fish Market, direct from New York City, we have their CEO, that's Mike. So you can DM or go Mike, right to him, Mike Tonetti. Really nice guy. And then Ariana, too. So if you guys have specific questions, Mike, I might call on you later just to kind of give us a little bit of something when we're getting to the history of Fulton. But, you know, he's like, oh, God. I'm like the teacher that put you on the spot. But you got the CEO, man. When you got the CEO, we got to hear from you. So, And then Ariana is on as well. She's a big part of their communications. She's been our amazing partner throughout this process. So if you have questions about uh, Fulton Fish Market, please make sure to reach out to either Ariana and Mike. A couple of things off the bat. Everyone here, I know a lot of people came to our Clams Putinesca class last one. With It was insane. But everyone here who is new, if you did not catch the Clams Putinesca, you're going to be able to get $50 off your first order at Fulton Fish Market. So mark that down. They will email you. It will all happen right in your email box. For those of you who have already accepted an offer and tried Fulton Fish Market. Raise your hand if you have ordered anything yet. Yes, good, 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 good. So for those that you have, you get $25. So you got 50 the first one, 25 the second one. So a total is 75. I have to say we work with a lot of people. No one is that generous, especially when it comes to seafood, which we all know can get kind of pricey. So thank you, Mike and Ariana and team at Fulton Fish Market. Let's dive in. What WTF is Booyah Base. What is Booyah Base? Throw it in the chat. Raise your hand. What is it? Let's just start at this first step here. Who can tell me? Scroll down so I can see real quick, my friend George. Fish and stew. Seafood stew. All right. I'm, I'm looking at the chat. Whatever comes through the chat is always hysterical. So it is a seafood stew. Um, absolutely originates from Marseille in France, coastal. And fishermen would come back, and this is true when it goes to like uh, hunters, you know, when, when people are out hunting wild boar or um, when there's foragers looking for mushrooms. Whenever you find a producer, whether it's a hunter, whether it's a fisherman, whether it's a forager, there always tends to be this dish that they all use with the scraps and the cheaper parts and the more economical parts. And it's always like the best dish. That is Booyah Base. It is a stew that fishermen came up with many years ago and it used all the catch of the day to make one gorgeous soup that they could bring home to their families and friends. Since then, it's become 
insane, like super fancy, very blown out. Everyone wants to make it, but when you try it, you kind of understand why. It is absolutely just beaming with the ocean. And uh, when you do it right, like I said, there's nothing better. But when you do it wrong, I'm not coming over. I'm not coming over. So we're going to go through that steps, how you cannot mess it up, and all the good stuff. I'll tell you, as unbelievable as the shrimp and the scallops and the mussels and the clams we got from Fulton Fish Market is, as unbelievably fresh and stunning these are, the, the key to this soup is the broth that they make. So... Step one is you got to have some good bread because you are going to want to sop this up, not just with your mouth, with anything you can find. So we're going to start by making a really good crostini, but I do want to call out real quick, we always talk about just the freshness. So we're in Seattle. Fulton Fish Market is in New York. There are, I'm going to say, most iconic brand because they've been around for 200 years. I don't think we work with anyone that's been around that long. So they kind of know what they're doing. And you would think, okay, they ship all of our fish to us for this. And it's incredible. I mean, when you think about what you look for at the grocery store, no cracks in the mussels, not one. No cracks or any funkiness to the clams, zero. Perfect, gorgeous, rosy pink shrimp, tight, no gumminess, nothing like that. And then these opaque, almost, look at these. These look like pearls, dry pack scallops. So no matter where you are in the country, Fulton Fish Market can get you what you need. Um, and I think a lot of us are places where we need good seafood and we can't just like go down to the market. So again, we'll put the link to Fulton Fish Market, $50 off your first order today, 25 off your second. All right, let's dive in. So Cristini numero uno. A lot of people mess up crostini, that's cool. This is how you do it correctly. First and foremost, you want a cast iron pan. Does anyone know why cast iron is so important for toasting crostini? Why is that so huge? George, anything in the chat? Yeah. Nothing yet? All right. Well, while I'm waiting for you guys, I am taking my crusty French loaf and I am cutting it on a bias, meaning I'm not just cutting it straight through, I'm cutting it kind of long wise, long ways. Not only does I think it look a little bit more elevated, but you get a lot more surface area actually hitting the bottom of the pan. So you have this really nice kind of long crostini, and I really dig that vibe. That looks great. So let's see. Yes. Miriam said, and Richard said, and Sabina said this too, all said the right thing, that cast iron is optimal because it's even heat. When you heat up a cast iron, it's not like heating up a nonstick pan or a, uh, a stainless steel pan. This has a lot more even heat all over the pan. So we love, love, love to toast bread in it. So I'm going to add a good amount of olive oil. You can do this in the oven as well. I think the uh, instructions you gave you more for the oven, but I like doing it in the pan old school. And a decent amount of oil in the bottom. We're almost lightly frying this bread. You know, and when the bread is, it's a key component to this because you want to soak up all that seafood. It's important to, you know, to give it its time, its time in the limelight, which in this case, we really want to give it a good toast. We put a lot of olive oil in and you just want to check it every once in a while. Look at the shimmer on that already. All right, so I'm just going to let this toast for a second. One of the things when toasting crostini, I'm just going to call out, do not, do not leave the kitchen. Like, don't go chase your kids to clean up a room. Don't go check your email. Don't look at Real Housewives or like the football game. None of that. None of that. You got to hang out with it a little bit or it will burn. It will totally burn in the blink of an eye. I'm a chef. I'll be shocked if I do not burn this live on camera for you. I will guarantee burn this. All right. I'm going to give a little bit more olive oil over the top. This is going to soak into the other side of the crostini. Again, we're almost frying this bread, which really allows that outer crust to kind of take in a little bit more of the seafood broth that we're getting from all the Fulton seafood. All right. So I'm just, I got little tongs here, just babysitting. And I'm just going to turn up my heat just a little bit more. Because I want to hear it 
literally hear it talk to me. Like, I want to hear it frying. I want to hear those bubbles. Cool. While those are toasting, notice I'm not leaving them. My eyes are... We're going to make a rui. What the heck is rui? With all these fun French terms today. Bouillabaisse, rui. What is rui? This is very traditional with bouillabaisse. Anyone know? AR, nice long tweezers. Thanks, man. What is it? George, anything in the chat? Thickener? Yeah, uh, it's not really a thickener. Rui is, is kind of like an aioli. Sometimes it's made with breadcrumbs. Sometimes it's made with just egg yolk. I don't expect you guys to make a homemade aioli on a Monday night. We wanted to kind of make this approachable every day. And so far, bread and olive oil is all we've got, so we're, we're keeping to that. But Rui is going to be a spread, a saffron-based spread that we're going to smear on our bread and serve with the actual bouillabaisse base itself. So you can see my bread. Look at this. I mean, that is how you toast bread, right? You want that golden brown throughout. And you can see it just happens so fast. You keep your eye off of it for three seconds, and it's like game over. So we're just getting these nicely toasted, almost there. I'd say about 10 seconds. This one is totally there. And you can do this way ahead of time. These do not need to be hot right when you're serving, nothing like that. Oh, yeah, that looks awesome. And it looks like we got our first question. Yeah. What's our first question? What would question? be a good substitute for the mayo in the aioli? What would be a good substitute for the mayo in the aioli? If you don't do mayo, go with Greek yogurt. Greek yogurt. Delicious. Probably a lot healthier, too. Not probably. It is. All right. So let's rock out this Rui. Rui. Um, one thing that you just can't get around, and myself and our recipe developers here at Homemade, we had an argument about this one because I really want to make food super approachable for you guys and every day, and I don't know. It's not very every day that we use saffron, <laughs> you know? So I was like, is there something that we could put in place of saffron? And the answer is for Rui and for bouillabaisse, it's really hard. This is super traditional. So saffron, obviously, that super expensive kind of thready ingredient Anyone tell me what saffron actually is? And by the way, I'm going with about a teaspoon into some warm water just to bloom, like tea. You can see it's just turning the, the water almost like turmeric yellow. But what is saffron? George, anything in the chat? Oh, there we go. Noel, the stamens of the saffron crocus. Nice job, Noel. So there's no way you guys are going to be able to see this, but... Each individual thread of saffron needs to be hand harvested from an orchid, from a specific type of orchid. They're so floral, but they're really expensive. So it gives you this really nice background flavor, but it is necessary for this recipe because we feel like it just cannot be replicated. There's a reason why they pick those things little by little. So for this, it couldn't be more easy. All we do is we start off with some may mayonnaise. Again, if you want to make it from scratch, go for it. I just figured most people wouldn't want to on a normal weeknight. So we've got some mayo. And then we called for some smoked paprika, which is really nice in this. About a teaspoon of smoked paprika. I got a clove of garlic that I'm not even going to chop. I'm just going to smash. Just like that. And if you smash it hard enough, it chops it for you. So that's going in. A squeeze of lemon, about half, right in. I like a lot of lemon because, you know, seafood, it's happening. And then about half this saffron mixture. So again, this is about a teaspoon of saffron and a little bit of hot water, which just kind of opens it up. And I whisk that through, and look at the color that starts to happen here. This beautiful light pink. And it will get pinker as... We kind of continue to cook here. But a Rui has kind of this light, I don't know, sweet fattiness to it that I love. I'm going to put a couple of the threads in there too. 
and it just makes for such a good spread. So that is our really, I'm going to call it a cheater's Rui. A little salt and pepper in there as well, of course. How could I forget? Beautiful. All right, so again, I'm going to spread this Rui on this bread once our seafood is cooked. So these two things get put to the side. Oh, they look so good. Any questions on that? Nada? All right. You guys are easy peasy today. So we're about to start the bouillon base. We're about to start the stew. And I think a lot of people hear stew and they're just like, ugh, it's going to be like forever. You're going to have to cook it for a long time. You need a big, big pot. This is not that type of stew. This is a stew that takes less than 20 minutes to whip up, and it is so fresh and light. It's not heavy, right? So first thing you need for your bouillabaisse is a Dutch oven, right? Again, this is also cast iron, so even heat. You are going to need the lid, so keep that around. All right, and I'm going to turn it on a medium-high heat, like a 5, 6 out of 10. And we're going to start with a little bit of aromatics inside the pan itself. So I'm going to add some olive oil, about a tablespoon, and a little bit of butter. And just start letting that melt down. I do both because the butter smokes while the olive oil kind of tames it. And then I've got three ingredients here that we're going to kind of start this base with. So garlic, onion, and fennel. I love fennel with seafood. Literally, I think Fulton should start selling fennel because it's so good with all seafood. It's like PB&J. And if you're not used to fennel, it looks like this in the store. Sometimes a much longer branch is coming off of it. But it kind of has a black licorice vibe to it. And wherever you see onion, you can replace it with fennel. So I've had fennel soup before. I mean, fennel's so versatile. So I'm just going to cut the top off and cut it in half. And then cut the fennel into little strips. And then cut those strips into little cubes. And get those right in. Beautiful. Do it again. So strips. They don't have to be like the smallest little cubes of all time. Kind of chunkier is better than here. This is a kind of a rustic seafood stew. And it looks oh. like we got another question. Yeah, please. What could you use to substitute the tomato paste with? Uh, if you want to get rid of the tomato paste, you can obviously, if you don't like tomato, just omit it. Take it out completely. You just have a little bit of a different color. But we are going, you can absolutely use just tomato sauce, like pureed tomato. If you really need to, you didn't hear it from me, you can use ketchup. That's all I'm saying. Not going deeper into that. All right. I'm going to use about half this onion. And again, fennel just kind of has this oniony vibe, but not with the bite, not with the sharpness. So if you don't like onion, you should try fennel. All right. So I've got half an onion right here. I'm going to chop this up. Again, I'm not worried about getting it too small. Just like a nice little dice. And it's not like we're trying to really caramelize these, but just kind of slowly start to get the flavor out of them. If you get a little browning, that's cool. Oh, it smells so good. All right, garlic. We're just going to chunk up into big little, big little, into thin little slices. So I have some garlic here. In France and in Italy, this is really how they do their garlic. They don't really mince it. They more slice it. And we got one more. And I love that. Yeah, bring um, it. Is there any good substitutes for the fennel? So if you cannot find fennel, just double up on onions or go leeks. Leeks. But it's really hard. I mean, fennel is, I don't know, it's got this kind of like sweet kind of candy-likeness to it. So really look for fennel. You can use fennel seeds, too. All right. Four cloves of garlic. In we go. And this puppy is starting to really do its thing. 
Again, not too much brown, just a little brown, right? And just let these flavors kind of start to open up. We're going to add a pinch of salt over the top. Oh, yeah. And you really want to just start smelling that garlic, smelling that caramelized fennel and onion, and just building the base to this stew. So we're just going layer by layer. What the most important layer is the seafood. But you kind of want to build a bath for this. <coughs> it looks so good. All right. So these are doing their thing. Next up is the kind of liquid ingredients, or the wet ingredients to this. So we got three ingredients here. <coughs> What we got, just that pepper's hitting me in the back of the throat. What we got is some white wine, tomato paste, and seafood stock. And I want to talk about seafood stock in a sec, but I want to get this tomato paste in. So once you're starting to get a little bit of color on your vegetables, you can go in with about a tablespoon or two of tomato paste. And you want to toast it into the vegetables. By toasting it, you want this kind of brick red color. It starts to change the whole stew. Look at the color. Really change. But by cooking it out, you don't have that really pronounced tomato flavor. It's more soft and subtle. That looks great. And then we're going to deglaze with a little bit of white wine. And now it's starting to look stewy. And we're going to just scrape. Just scrape. Look at the color of that, man. Is that crazy? I mean, it's just, it happens so fast. It looks like TJ has a question. Yeah, yeah, please. If you did use uh, fennel seeds, how, how much would you use? Uh, for every bulb of fennel, I'd use about a tablespoon of fennel seeds. Yeah, great question. All right, so I'm cooking that wine down, and you know it's time when the wine is out, when you can put your nose in there. And it doesn't, <laughs> great with the glasses, perfect. But it doesn't burn your nose. So you should be able to put your nose down and it has no burn. You just smell the sweetness of the wine. This looks really great. Still, it needs another second. And while this is simmering, we're going to then add seafood stock. Now, seafood stock, and we saved our, um, our shells from our Fulton order. So these are the shells from our little prawns. So you can make your own seafood stock and literally Fulton sells bones, little pieces of fish, trim. And so on your next order, you could have that and make incredible risottos, chowders, or bouillabaisse, like what we're doing today. Um, so you can absolutely do your own or you can buy it. If you do buy it, just get low sodium. That way you can really kind of control the amount of salt that goes in. So I'm going to go in with a couple of cups of seafood stock and just bring this to the boil. Oh my gosh. It smells so good. Look at this. Look at the color. Again, kind of that brick red. And at this point, I really, really, really want to kind of bring it up to the boil. All right. Oh, I forgot to add in my saffron. So the rest of that saffron in as well. How dare I almost forget that. All right. So that all happened really fast. I want to make sure I slow down for a sec. And for those of you who are cooking along, that we kind of line up for a sec. So I want to recap and then I want to take some questions. So first thing we did is we basically just toasted some bread and some olive oil. We put that to the side. We made a roux -y which is basically just mayonnaise spiked up with a little bit of smoked paprika, garlic, and some, um, I'm spacing out, saffron, thank you. Um, and then we started to make our bouillabaisse itself, our fish stew, right, our seafood stew. We started with fennel, onions, and garlic, and a little bit of olive oil. Then we added some tomato paste and deglazed with white wine, and then topped it all with some fish stock, or seafood stock. And now we're just bringing it to the boil. But what questions we got? Anything in the chat, George? Uh, I think everything uh, has been answered so far. Oh, we okay. do got a question right now, actually. Yeah. Hi, Linda. All 
Oh, you got to unmute, my dear. Yeah. Okay. There Hi. you go. Um, I'm allergic to scallops. I'm not allergic to shrimp or mussels or clams. What else can I use? Instead of scallops? Well, first of all, for yeah. this recipe, just take them out. Um, so you don't need to use them. But I would go with halibut. I would try halibut. Oh, okay. It's got a really similar texture. would be really good. Monkfish is a really good one if you want to try something new. Um, so those are the two that I would probably go with. And I could drive to the Fulton Fish Market because I live in New York. <laughs> I can't tell by your accent. I know I have an accent to you, but you sound like you live in the Fulton Fish Market with that accent. I love it. I love it. No, no. I no. was just making a joke. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, when I used to live there, I think, you know, there's some things, you know, about Fulton that is so iconic. You know, as a chef, and I used to live in New York City, Fulton, again, being around for 200 years, Fulton was really a bridge between chefs and where they got their seafood. And it wasn't really until recently um, in their history where Fulton has helped us, people at home, get their seafood. And you have to understand, in restaurants, there is no, <clears throat> there's no, there's no patience for seafood that is not high quality. The bar is set extremely high. So chefs only work with people who take it extremely seriously. There has to be no smell. The fish has to be just wide-eyed and clear, right? The scallops have to be firm and just sweet-smelling. And you do not have 200 years of history without 200 years of delivery. And they just time and time again, Fulton has delivered for the best chefs in the world, and now they go right to your doorstep with technology, with digital. You don't have to be Linda to live in their backyard. You can live anywhere you want and savor everything that Fulton has to offer, which is really cool. Thank you, Linda. Sherry. Thank you. Hello. Hello. What's going on? <laughs> um, I, well, we have great fish out here, too, in San Diego, because we have the fish, our tuna harbor. But yes. and then every Saturday, our fishmongers come out in from, you have to get there early, but you can get fresh fish right off the docks. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. And, and of course, I do buy uh, what you, exactly what you said is you, is I get the bones and stuff to make yes, a stock. Yes. But if not to, I don't know if you mentioned in your suggestions, but every time you buy non peeled into vein shrimp, mm -hmm. you save the shells. It makes a very rich stock. I just throw them in the freezer. Exactly. Throw them in the freezer, pull them out, that, a little celery, onion, carrot, 30, 40 minutes, and you've got the most gorgeous stock. And I'm so with you. Being in Seattle, you know, we have Pike Place Market. There's a million places to buy fish. The difference between Fulton Fish Market and I think where a lot of us live coastally is their breadth of assortment. I mean, they're getting stuff that you can't even imagine. There's stuff that definitely Seattle being on the coast, you know, we get a lot of beautiful stuff from Alaska, but that's like our little point, right? And so for you too, Sherry, it's like you have San Diego and that little point, but with Fulton, it kind of opens up the world, which I love about them. Um, but thank you, Sherry. Yep, that's why the shrimp's a great idea for all those people like in the Midwest who don't get, yes. you know, up. they could buy the frozen and then they can make their own stock. It's it's better than probably trying to find fish in the middle of winter. Agreed but. on so many levels. Agreed. Thank you. So let's talk about seafood for a sec. I mean, it is the core of this soup. Obviously, we have started a great base. It's now just simmering away. You can see little bubbles happening every once in a while. So it's just kind of like taking its time. It's like a bath and everyone's about to join the party. All right. So let's start with mussels. First and foremost, mussels are one of the most sustainable things you can buy and eat. They are packed full of iron, packed. These are so healthy for you. And they're incredibly economical, very inexpensive. My favorite part about them, they tell you when they're done. They open up when they're done, which is Awesome. So there's no guessing, nothing like that. Sometimes when you buy mussels, they come with a little thing on the side of it called a beard. Uh, it looks like I don't, none of these have them. This is indicative of Fulton where the, all the cleaning has been done ahead of time. But um, they have like a little, it almost looks like a little rough patch that they cling on to things like, you know, docks and rocks and things like that to hold on to. But when you find a really good fishmonger or fish market like Fulton, they do that all for you. So these are completely clean, de-bearded is what it's called. Again, some markets will do it, some won't. And then we have one here I wanted to show you. So you see how this is open? So clams are alive or, and mussels are alive when you get them. 
So what you want to do is when you see an open one is you can kind of tap on the shell or just close them lightly and wait till about three seconds. If it reopens, it means that this one is no longer good and we want to toss it. If it shuts, it means it's alive and good to go, which this one has shut. So we have a live muscle. Again, there's so much when you go to the market, there's so much, uh, I don't know, when I go to my local market, I'll just say it, out of my bag of clams, sometimes I throw away a quarter of them because they're cracked or they're open. Again, when you go to Fulton, they're curating the best clams. They have the best people on the floor looking for those cracks, looking for those openings. So they're doing kind of that hard work for you. And I'm wondering, just before I move on to the next seafood, we got Mike. We got the man himself, okay? So I got to call on you, Mike. So when you have, I mean, we've got thousands of people here logged on for this class. I want to know, how is it that you're able to, and, and I mean this dead serious, how is it that you're able to kind of find the best seafood, curate it at scale, like, uh, and, and then ship it? Like, what is it around your team that makes that possible? Can we unmute Mike? There we go. Oh, Mike, you just got to unmute, buddy. You know, I do uh, Zoom calls all day, and I still, for years, and I still don't have that down. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> no, I appreciate Can you guys hear me all right? Yeah, we can hear you perfect, buddy. Cool. Um, yeah, no, I appreciate all the, all the kind words and uh, some of the, good, the great uh, chat call-outs as well. Uh, so, I, I mean, so much of it just has to do with, with the market itself and, and with our team. So, you know, as, as Joel mentioned, you know, the market's been around for, uh, this is actually our 200 year anniversary this year. Um, it opened in Crazy. 1822. So a lot of this is just, you know, years of, of experience. And uh, there's about 30 individual vendors uh, in the market. Some of them have been around since uh, the 1800s as well. So lots of, you know, knowledge kind of passed down through, through the generations and lots of, you know, really close relationships built with, uh, with fishermen and, and local boats, you know, being right on the, on the water there. The boats actually used to come right up into the Fulton Fish Market when it was based, uh, you know, in downtown Manhattan. Uh, and now, you know, it all comes in within, you know, often within a day of being caught, uh, you know, depending on, on the seafood. And then uh, once it's in the market, uh, you know, we just have uh, such a fantastic team um, you know, that's there doing the buying each night. And so uh, because we're based in the market, we typically get to shop the stalls before the market itself opens. Uh, so we get the first pick. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, the chefs do the same thing. They always try to be yes. first in line. Um, and so we are, you know, truly first in line so we can get, you know, uh, the first pick of, of what comes into the market. Uh, and we, we just have... Uh, such a fantastic team, you know, it's been in the seafood industry for, for years. And so as they go around, uh, you know, depending on what they're buying, uh, you know, they really know what to look for, uh, for each of the items. Uh, and then, you know, it's just right down to the, to the folks, um, you know, cutting the items each night or, or packing the shellfish, uh, taking a look at it and making sure that, you know, only the best, uh, you know, goes out the door. I love um, it. So, yeah, a lot of a lot of effort that goes into it, but being right there in the market where all of it is uh, is right at our fingertips is kind of kind of the key. Yeah, I would say that's pretty magic. I mean, and you guys, like Mike said, chefs would get there. I mean, I remember getting there at three in the morning, four in the morning sometimes, just to get first pick because you want that specific octopus or you want that side of salmon or whatever it is. Now they have their team doing that for you. So again, we'll share you their link, but people who are curating, picking out, thoughtfully finding what you need at home, which I love. That's why this is the top quality that you can find as far as seafood goes, delivered right to your door. So thank you, Mike. Thank you for upholding the 200-year tradition. Insanity, insanity. Real quick, I want to go to Michael, and then we'll go to Miriam. Go for it. Joel. Happy um, whatever it is at this time of year, because there's a lot of it going on around. Yes, um, yes. Uh, one question. Lizard's iPad was nice enough to answer part of this, 
the difference between chiapino and bouillabaisse. She mentioned that uh, chiapino is more tomato-based, bouillabaisse is more stock-based. Yes. But anything you might add to that. And the other thing is saffron being as expensive as it is, there's a lot of phony saffron oh, out there. Oh, yeah. So I would love your uh, expertise in terms of saffron to avoid the annatto, you know, just to add the color, et cetera, and your feelings on that. Yeah, I'll answer those too quickly. I lived in San Francisco for about five years. So Chipino typically, like you said, has actually tomato puree or canned tomatoes in it. So chunkier tomato, almost like a, imagine a marinara with seafood in it. Delicious. I love it. Served with, of course, because you're in San Francisco, sourdough bread. A lot of people also say it's more garlicky. And a lot of Chipino actually adds pesto instead of rui. Don't know where that came from, but... That is also a very chipino esque thing to do. Also, chipino loads up on the fish, meaning white fish, um, less oily fish. Like, you're not going to find salmon, but you will see cod and halibut in a chipino. While in a classic bouillabaisse, it's really the shellfish that does. And your the comment on uh, saffron. Uh, uh, saffron, yeah. If you ever see saffron, ever, that's either A, not expensive, it's not real, and B, ground. So you need to see those threads. If you see ground saffron, you know they're mixing it with turmeric or something else. I don't know what they mix it with, but it's, it's not the real deal. Thank you, Mike. Good to see you. Happy holidays back at you. Miriam, I'm going to get to you in one second, but I got I to gotta talk about this seafood real quick. So that's mussels. Clams, we talked about this last class, but I know a lot of people were not here. When you get clams, whether it's from Fulton Fish Market or anywhere else, you put them in a bowl of water like this, and you just add salt over the top of it, a good handful of salt, like literally with this. We already did this, but that much salt. So they, they think that they're in the ocean, and you let them sit for at least 10 to 15 minutes to burp. So burp means they open up because they're alive too, and they open up because they think they're home in the ocean, which is really great, and that kind of gets rid of a lot of the sandiness that sometimes they carry. So that's our clams, our scallops, which is arguably my favorite seafood in the world. I love, love, love scallops. These are little dry packed, sweet little scallops. And they sometimes come with something called a foot. And I don't know if you guys can see that, but this is how they connect to the shell. They have this little foot here. And you just peel that off. This is also very, very, very good in your seafood stock. But I kind of look for these scallops, and one of the tricks I like, especially with bouillabaisse, and then I want to get to Miriam, is I take my paring knife, and I kind of cross or crosshatch, almost like tic-tac-toe, through my scallop. So I kind of pinch it, and then I crosshatch it. That opens up the scallop. I do this when I sear it sometimes, too. But it opens up the scallop, allowing it to take in more broth. I just love scallops. Now, what I love about them at... Fulton Fish Market is they're dry packed, which means they're incredibly easy to sear. And you can get jumbo ones, tiny ones like these ones that are sweet, even smaller bay ones. So really the possibilities are endless. But Miriam, let me hit you real quick. What is up, my dear? Hi, I'm just, um, I was just first going to say that uh, bouillabaisse, the term comes from an old French term meaning to boil and then to simmer. Oh. Uh, but here, that. being on the West Coast, we're definitely more familiar with uh, Chapina, which yes. is my, my hubby's favorite. I just wanted to say, you know, I was really skeptical when I put in the order because coming, you know, having fish shipped uh, all the way from New York to the West Coast, um, it came, you know, over overnight and... Um, it was like, we don't usually eat cod. We really can't find it. Um, right. And it was fantastic. It was uh, delicate, uh, like melt in your mouth. It was so tasty and, uh, you know, white. And uh, I did it on papio. They, oh. they had an online recipe. Nice. I've done papio before, but they had a wonderful um, recipe with uh, asparagus. And then um, the salmon we're going to uh, probably eat uh, in a few days. We froze it. For when our son comes to visit, I <laughs> love that. Oh, but, I love yeah, that. Yeah, it was just so. Tell Mike and his staff. It, yeah, I was really surprised, and it was really great. I love it. I love it, Mike. I'm, I see you smiling. That that would make <laughs> anyone smile. But 
It's, it's no joke, guys. I mean, you would think seafood across... I would have the same feelings Miriam did. Like, you're going to ship my seafood across the country. Right. Yes, they pack it right. It comes to you right. By the way, empapayo, for those of you who don't know, is cooking in parchment paper. It steams it really gently and beautifully. Oh, Miriam, thank you for sharing. That is awesome. Welcome. Awesome. Take care. You too. All right, guys. And then I've got these stunning sweet prawns. Um... We left the shell on. I, I like to get them the shell on because I like to use the shell for so many different things. But what you can do is just kind of take the shell off. Again, don't waste it. Right? You can push that to the side. And then what I like to do is you can kind of run your knife, just a little paring knife, on the back of your prawn. And you just kind of take out this little vein. And now, if this is not your thing, they have peeled and deveined shrimp already at Fulton. So you can absolutely do this. But this is the one little step that we like to do is just kind of devein it. So I'll show you guys again. Uh, do I have one? Yeah, here we go. You can also use the knife to kind of help get the shell off if you want. You can kind of start in the top here and move down. Open it up. You can see these are already so clean and lush. But see how they're pink without even being cooked? It's a very good sign of freshness. Look at that. It's like little baby lobsters. These are awesome. All right, guys. Well, we've talked about cleaning clams, mussels. Look at this guy. This guy just does not want to close. <laughs> you close them up and then he, the party's over, but he just wants to talk. He's like me in muscle form. Um, so what we want to do now is we kind of want to, it's kind of a game at this point. I'm going to wash my hands real quick. Actually, no, I'm going to go in with the seafood, so it's all good. But... It's kind of a game because these are going to cook so quickly. That's what I love about seafood is it just cooks in the blink of an eye. And each one of these things tell you when they're done, right? Clams open up, mussels open up, shrimp turn pink, and the clams get really white and firm and opaque. So each one kind of has that indicator. But you have to decide in this game what's going to take the longest to cook and what's going to take the least amount of time to cook. And it's sometimes difficult to tell when you don't have a chef in your face telling you. But, you know, obviously the bigger something is, the longer it's going to take to cook. So these clams are pretty massive. So I'm going to start by adding my clams in first. So I'm literally going to take my clams and just nestle them into the bouillabaisse. And they're going to open up and give the most jolty, just enhancement you can possibly imagine to this bouillabaisse stock. They are going to have, they have little pockets of ocean inside their shells. It's so delicious. And so I'm going to give these about a minute just because they're so big. And then you kind of want to time it where it's like, okay, everything else then goes in next. They're all around the same size. Shrimp, scallops, mussels, they're going to take about two to three minutes to cook. So you just want to kind of finish it right at the end, right right where they all end together. So the clams are getting maybe a minute, two minutes more, and then everything else in. Now, if I was adding cod or halibut um, or any other fish to this, you can cube those up and add those in. I would add those in now because those just take a little bit longer. But again, if you miss it by a minute, it's not the end of the world. It's the broth that this seafood gives off that's dreamy. And then, of course, when you get a piece of seafood in your mouth, it's a very nice surprise. All right, here we go. So then, I'm going to start tucking in my mussels. Oh, these look so good. All right. Our gorgeous, sweet, these are like candy, these scallops. Again, if you can't find scallops, which you can now because you have Fulton with your discount, but if you can't, for whatever reason, any white fish will do. And then we have our shrimp. You just kind of want to tuck those in. And I left the tails on because the tails have a lot of flavor. And they're fun to kind of hold and eat off. That looks great. Oh, and you can see it's just simmering away. I'm going to close the lid for about two to three minutes while this just does its thing. And I'm going to give my hands a quick wash. I would love to take some questions. Uh, hopefully I've got the answers for you. But what is on your mind?
Can you freeze the leftovers? Yeah, good question. You cannot freeze the leftovers because there's shells in there. So later, I'm going to show you guys how to eat this and kind of how to put it together. But as long as you can get rid of the shells and maybe you scrape off the mussels and the clams into it, so it's just seafood meat and the broth, then you can freeze it. But obviously, you would not want to freeze mussels or clams, like in the shell. And it looks like Nancy has a question. Yeah, please, Nancy. Hi. Hi, Joel. Um, this has been so interesting, okay. and I really have enjoyed you teaching us how to fix the seafood. But my question would be, when you're getting your meal ready, how long before you would put your uh, seafood into the pot, would you have it sit on a counter? Mm. I, I mean, if 20 minutes, I mean, if I was taking shells off the shrimp, might take me a while. Should I get that ready, then put them in the refrigerator and yeah. a few minutes before? And is that the same thing with the scallops? Or is everybody on different amounts of times, like the um, clams in the water being burped, she said 20 minutes. But could you take them from the refrigerator and put them in the water, or do they need to sit at room temperature before you would salt them? Such a good question, Nancy. Thank you for asking. So you can take them all right from the refrigerator. In fact, you should. So ours are hanging out. They've been very chilled. But seafood, you really don't want to let it sit out for more than 30 minutes. So you should go right from the refrigerator right into the pot. And honestly, there's a lot of good frozen seafood, too. There's nothing wrong with frozen seafood. Um, and you can go right from the freezer into the pot as well. It will obviously take a little bit longer, but you can do that. Oh, okay. That yeah. sounds really interesting. Yeah. This is super enlightening tonight. Thank oh, you. good, good, good. Debbie C., talk to me. Hey there, you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you great. What's up? I was just wondering if you had found out about those freshwater clams. Oh, I have not. But fresh, <laughs> I love that you brought it up last time. Who was it that told you about it? And I'm like, what? Who told well, you? My husband Your heard husband. you saying that you could eat fresh, no, you could eat raw clams. And he says, no, 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 no. Not if they're freshwater clams. Well, they're mussels. And then we started wondering if there were actual, you want to say hi while you're here? <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you. I'm directing from afar. <laughs> My type of guy. I don't know. You know let me ask. Let's ask. We have Mike on. Let's ask Mike. Mike, there have you go. ever heard of freshwater clams? Is that just me that I haven't? Uh, freshwater clams, I have not heard of. Okay. Um, you know, <laughs> we, uh, we don't sell any uh, ourselves. Um, so they don't exist is what no. you're saying. Because if Fulton doesn't sell them, they probably don't exist. <laughs> I yeah, love it. No, I, I'm not sure. I haven't, uh, haven't heard of it. I'm sure. But you know what? There's, I, I mean, my gosh, you know, thousands of, of species of seafood. So It's true. It's true. I'm sure there, there's something out there. Thank you, Mike. We had yeah, to ask the guy. You. We had to ask the man himself. <laughs> you guys, I'm just taking this Rui and I'm just smearing it on the bread like this. Just beautiful. You can see the nice here, pink here, color. Oh, that's beautiful. All right. And then, there we go. Rustic, stunning. This is exactly how you get it in France. So we've got these beautiful little pieces of bread dressed with their aioli. And then I've got the tops of the fennel. You don't need this part. You can just use some fresh parsley. But we're just going to kind of chunk that up. And I am going to add a little bit of fresh parsley, too. And I'm just going to chop this in. And at this point, I can tell you, our seafood is 100% done. Should be. If not, we'll give it some more time. But just a light chop on our greenery here. All right, let's take a look. One, two, three. Oof. All right, got to give that puppy just a little bit of a stir. Because if we don't, I mean, we're not seeing the glory. Ugh. And it looks like Judith has a question. Yes, Judith. If you serve this at a dinner party, what would you want as a starter, a side, and a dessert with this? Ooh, great question. So if I was to serve this at a dinner party, what would I want as a starter, side, and dessert? A starter, I would do something on toast like this. 
Uh, a side, I want something that's going to soak into it. So rice, egg noodles, mashed potatoes, or of course, bread. I would have a light salad on the side just to kind of balance it out. Um, and then for dessert, I mean, up to you. Whatever is seasonal and beautiful, but I would go with something chocolate. Keep it in the French world. Or creme brulee would be really nice. Guys, look at these tender, gorgeous scallops. See how I kind of open them up? So they take in. The shrimp is not overcooked, but you can see it's curled and pink. Right? All those muscles, you just kind of pop open. And they're just little pockets of broth. This is why this dish is so popular. It is such a win. Look at these clams. What are you? Look at these giant clams you get from Fulton. Look at that thing. I want to hold it up. You don't see that every day. That is humongo. Humongo. One more side. I get so excited about seafood. You guys know this. Look at that thing. Oh my gosh. All right. So we kind of mix it all up. And then at the very end, I like to mix in just a little bit of the greenery. Look at the color. You bring that to the table and you are a rock star. You are Beyonce at that point. You are Beyonce. All right? You are Queen Bee. It does not get more beautiful than that, more rustic than that, more craveable than that. I mean, that is it. That is cooking. So what I like to do to serve this real quick is I'll get a bowl. I'll put these little breads next to it, right? And I'll just start ladling out. I try and get to the bottom. I just want you guys to see the broth. Oh, my gosh. You guys. I mean, come on. Look at the, the texture of that broth. It's not too thick. It's beautiful. And I always try and go with just enough broth where the seafood kind of pops out of it like that. And then a little bit more greenery on top. The greenery really just adds freshness and brightness. And that right there, maybe with a little lemon wedge tucked into it. I don't know. You guys. I mean, you know we're completely live here. There's no games, no gimmicks. That is all done. If I wasn't yapping my big mouth, that is a quick, healthy, and just stunning, stunning dish. All right, I'll show you a little side view here. But just unbelievable. Unbelievable. So I got to dive into this. Did anyone make it at home? Do you see anyone out there, George? At least who's sharing their camera? I know a lot of people don't share. Not that I am seeing at the moment. Okay, all right. Well, I am diving in, a little bit of bread. I'm going after the broth first. So you got that saffron aioli, that rui, and just kind of dredge it. Stop. This is why I love my job. Oh, I love cooking so much. You just taste layers upon layers. I just want to try that broth with the fennel. It's unbelievably subtle, but it's so good. Look at these shrimp. They're, again, like mini lobsters. They're huge, juicy. Mm. Not overcooked at all. Stunning. I'm going to grab a little bit of that scallop because that is my favorite. When you can cut through a scalp with a spoon like that, you cook them right. Oh, Susan, she's making it also. Mm. Susan, nice. Or Suzanne, nice. <laughs> Looks awesome. I know a lot of other people are making it. I love when you guys cook alongside me. You guys, I could eat this every day, all day. There's a reason why those fishermen had it right back in the day. Mm. This is everything, and you guys... The key to it, and we all know this, I don't have to reiterate it a million times, is having incredible seafood. And if you want incredible seafood, you go to Fulton Fish Market. And real quick, we're going to share our screen, just because I know a lot of people will um, 
will kind of wonder, okay, like where do I go once I'm on there? So we're just going to share real quick so you can see. So uh, there you go. Perfect. Hopefully you guys can all see this. But this is their website, so FultonFishMarket.com. It gets delivered right to your door. I love that, from the sea to the door. And then it has your favorites, like your salmon, your tuna, but you'll find so many other things on there that you would never, ever expect. Again, if you've never ordered from them, today you're going to get $50 off your first order. And if you have ordered from them, you're going to get a $25 gift from them. So they're incredible. You can create these little bundles. So I love that they have these little gift boxes or boxes for yourself. They're incredible. So, I mean, it's a no-brainer. If you have never made bouillabaisse, if you've never made risotto with lobster, if you've never had a perfectly pan-seared piece of salmon, they're giving it to you. Try it. Test the quality. They are not scared to stand behind 200 years of tradition and heritage and experience. I love it. We love them. We are beyond humble just to call ourselves partners with them. It's a sustainable, healthy way to cook. So I don't care if you're not a seafood person. You try it. Give it a go, and you will never look back, ever. Any last questions before I face plant into this very hot bowl of bouillabaisse? Not that I am seeing. Nothing. I'm giving it one more second. It's really just an excuse for me to sit here and eat. All right. Well, you guys, if you want to see more Fulton and homemade classes, throw it in the chat. What would you like us to cook up with you? We'd love to see if there's a recipe specifically around seafood or fish that you really want to dive deeper into. No pun intended. Actually, fully pun intended. That, that was a good one. Um, I also want to call out in literally less than a week. No, in a little bit more than a week. Next Thursday on the 15th, we are coming out with our very first course, Homemade in a Hurry. It is all about how to cook fast, how to cook seamlessly in the kitchen. So if you're interested in that, George will put the link in the chat. And you can go click and sign up for our wait list, which is now getting over 1,400 people long. Amazing gift. Um, we're going to announce the price and everything coming up soon. But you'll hear more rhetoric around that in our email. More than anything, we want to thank Fulton Fish Market. Looks like we've got some really good ideas. And Papayo, Chapino, Monkfish Marsala. Yum. What else? How about a show about the seven fishes? Tony, I love that. How did we not nail that? It's so smart. All right, we'll come up with a lot of ideas. I'm sure we'll be back with Fulton Fish Market. I want to thank them, Ariana, Mike, and the full team over there in New York who's putting their best foot forward to make sure that seafood lands on our table timely and at pristine condition. And more than anyone, I want to thank you for hanging out with us in the kitchen. I know thousands of people logged on today, so thank you, thank you for your time and for cooking from scratch. That is what we are all about. We love you. We will see you on the next one. Take care. Sayonara, or I should say au revoir. Au revoir.